This is a question I, I come up against a lot because I, the question of, well, what is your responsibility to the historical record when you are doing fact-based material, whether it's film, or television, or stage? And I do a fair amount of adaptation or, or historically based material, so I wrestle with this. Um, first off, you have to be very clear about what the parameters are and, and what you are doing. I am not a historian. Let me repeat that. I am not a historian. I'm a dramatist. That means that I am going to pillage the historical record. I'm going to be selective about the historical record because I have a point of view on the his historical record. I am telling a very specific story. Two, I am telling that very specific story with some very severe constraints. Bob Cairo can spend 20 years writing what is now, what, four volumes, approaching how many thousands of pages, and lay out in painstaking detail and fascinating minutia the step-by-step -step progress of Lyndon Baines Johnson. I have two hours and 45 minutes. That's important. That means that I'm going to have to make a lot of decisions, that I'll, there's going to be a lot on the cutting room floor. And just the act of omission changes things. Okay. But again, I'm not presenting this as a documentary. I'm not presenting this as history. This is my take on this individual and this time and this particular story. Um, within that, and, and so, I, so I will take liberties with the historical record. I, um, just in terms of all the way, for example, sometimes uh, you have a happy accident of history from a dramaturgical standpoint, such as uh, the idea that uh, the Gulf of Tonkin event, the attack on American forces in the Gulf of Tonkin, which then prompts the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, actually takes place within the same 24 hours that the bodies of the three murdered civil rights workers are discovered buried in an earthen dam in Mississippi. Well, that's pretty amazing. Just the juxtaposition of these two events, the unearthing of this one crime and the commission of another crime superimposed over one another is pretty amazing. Now, what I do with that theatrically by, by literally filtering both of them visually so they happen simultaneously on stage is, is part of what I do as a dramatist in theater. But, for example, when I do a similar kind of event towards the end of the second act where we see Martin Luther King as the youngest winner, winner of the Nobel Prize delivering a very impassioned and quite profoundly moving speech of idealism and optimism about the human race. And I juxtapose that with the letter that the FBI constructed and sent to King's house uh, in a box containing illegal wiretaps of his assignation with other women and the letter suggests that he should kill himself. Well, those two events actually didn't happen at the same time. Uh, the Nobel Prize is in November and the poison pen letter is three months later in February. But I, I place them one on top of another because I, I want to juxtapose these two very different visions of America. I want to juxtapose these two very different men and what they're about. Um, because it is dramatic and it's, it's theatrical and because it speaks to what I am talking about here, about power and idealism. So, so there's an example of where I have played very consciously with the chronology. I've not altered these events. These events really happened. King really did win the Nobel Prize. These are his words, and I've edited them severely. And J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI really did this incredibly appalling thing. We, and here are, here are the literal words from that. But that's a choice. And then I, I make up dialogue. I write most of my dialogue is me constructing what, how I think these characters talk and how they sound, even though 
there is historical record, thanks to the FBI. We are privy to lots of conversations that we might not have been. But I'm not just selecting that and you know, gluing it together. I am actually creating dialogue and creating scenes that maybe never happened. I put people together who maybe never had this conversation or met because I have a very specific story to tell. What I think, what I'm careful not to do is to be unfair to any of these characters. I don't think that I have any of these people behaving in ways that they didn't behave or they wouldn't have behaved. I think I am true to the historical record as it unfolded over time. I think I am more fair to LBJ than Shakespeare was to Richard III, for example, which is still a pretty good play. Um, so it's a, it, it's a challenging, uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderfully challenging thing to do to work with people who really existed in events with which we are familiar or we think we are familiar. Part of what I've discovered is my own, the gaps in my own knowledge, and I think of myself as a pretty smart guy. Uh, and, um, and to play with that in terms of the story that I want to tell about Lyndon Baines Johnson and November 63 to November 64. Um, I, I will say that um, the response thus far from those who lived in this time period or experienced it has been uniformly positive. Uh, nobody has come to me and said, oh my God, you, you've got this so wrong. You never, never wouldn't have done that, never did this. Um, I've had very, very minor and very genteel criticism. And generally it has to do with language. Um, but by and large, I'm pleased to say um, that those who knew Johnson and worked in the administration, who have seen or read the play, or worked in the civil rights movement for that matter, feel that I got it right. That, yeah, that's what it felt like. Yes, thank you for telling this.